Welcome to the R Studio Visualization webinar um, on February 8th, 2022. Um, we really appreciate you coming. This is actually um, put on by the MAA um, and through a program called Stat Prep. The Stat Prep is a conglomeration of the ASA, MAA, and AMATIC. Um, there's an MAA recording policy. We are recording this event. Um, we do retain the right to show it again and distribute it, and you are agreeing to that by being here. Um, so if you move on, um, we do have a shared document that you can use. I will put that in the chat right now. So in this, it's actually a shared uh, Google Drive, and you can look and see some nice folders of information we have available to you. Joe, did you want to go there yet, or you figure? Um, yeah, we can do that. So um, essentially, this is just uh, a Google folder that I'll share with everybody that has the slides, um, the R code that we'll be using a little bit later today, um, and then a question document. So if you've been in our webinars or workshops before, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to ask questions in R using the uh, chat function in Zoom. Um, if you want to copy and paste error codes or uh, screenshots, you can go ahead and put that in this uh, shared doc and uh, we'll monitor this and answer it throughout the, the webinar and, and we'll try to clean up any questions that are unanswered afterwards. So, And I just put a link in the chat to the, chair, to the question document. I'm going to re-put in the link to the shared document in the chat. So both of those are there for you to get into and use. All right. Um, yes. Yes. So if you move to the next slide, um, again, my name is Catherine Kozak. Um, I'm at the Coconino Community College in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm also on the Stat Prep leadership team, and I am the past president of the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. Um, and Kate, I'm gonna just real quick, I think you may have sent those links just to the host and panelists. Oh, so shoot. if you wanna switch that to everybody. Yes, I'm sorry, thank you. Yep, no worries. Uh, and I am Joe Royth. Um, I teach at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Um, I've been part of the stat prep team for uh, six or seven years um, from the beginning when we first started our, our workshops. Uh, and I've been doing a few of the, the different workshops and webinars throughout the last couple of years since we've been online and, and they've been really fun. Um, I'm really excited about, uh, about this particular uh, workshop, webinar, I should say. Okay. All right. So hopefully people, we've got the links there. Yes. I did post them to everyone. So hopefully you've seen the two links. Um. Perfect. Okay. And um, so again, NSF, um, Stat Prep is an NSF grant that's um, a collaboration between the MAA, ASA, and AMATIC. It is about data. So Stat Prep's goal is to help um, faculty teach data-centric skills to their classes, their introductory classrooms. We have on our website, which I'm also going to put into the chat, uh, we have um, materials for you to use in your classes. We have little apps you can go into and use. That's actually a picture of one of our little apps we use. And um, we have also uh, recordings of this webinar are there. So you can go into that webinar and you'll see different recordings you have. We did a recording of a webinar in November on just the basics of our studio and data um, analysis. And so these are places for you to have. We, have, um, we also have uh, um, newsletters we put out every year. So there's also some new newsletters that are available there and so forth for you to go into and utilize on that site. So um, in the little apps, we also have some activities you can use in your classes. All right, so Joe, why don't you go ahead and um, talk about how we can do data visu visualization. I can't say that word obviously very well. Yeah, it's gonna be a tough one today um, <laughs> after saying it about 
you know, a hundred times. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so welcome to this, to this webinar about uh, data visualization. Um, you know, I know that we sort of sold this to you as uh, data visualization using our studio and ggplot, and we're definitely going to get there. Um, but I actually wanted to take a few minutes at the, at the start of this webinar to talk a little bit about um, how you might approach teaching data visualization um, and some of the some of the concepts that you may want to sprinkle into some of your classes or into some of your own work maybe. So like I said, I just want to give you a quick overview before we jump into the R and um, talk about you know what makes a good data visualization. Um, and, and by far I think that the the main thing that we want to keep in mind is that, a really good data uh, visualization, a really good plot, really good graph, um, it needs to tell a story, right? Uh, it needs to tell a story that's the sort of creator intended, right? Not just a story that the, that the viewer makes up on their own. Um, so some things that you know, we wanna think about when we're, when we're planning or preparing our, our visualization is, you know, is it gonna be an explanatory visualization where you are telling a, a very directed message um, or is it an exploratory uh, visualization where you wanna to try to find out some patterns or trends or you're asking the questions. Um, and, and we wanna keep in mind, and, and this is something that, I, that I'm starting more and more to, to tell my students, right? Is that your, your visualizations, they should be like an actual story. They should go through revisions um, edits, um, you should get feedback, um, you should, should let other people look at it and give that, you know, have them give you their first impressions and see if that's what you intended. Um, but in the end, it really boils down to, you know, you should keep it simple. I think that with all the technology that we have, and we'll see some of it today, um, it's really easy to, to go overboard, to, to get cluttered, um, to, to make the visualization hard to read, hard to understand. Right when I think back to the uh, you know Tufty and keeping as little ink on the page as possible while still being able to convey your message. So um, the the link that I have here, I won't open this up right now, but this link is also in our shared folder. Um, it's basically just a, a document that I threw together with with some resources for um, textbooks and blogs and um, other articles about the some of the different topics that we'll talk about. Um, today for data storytelling and just good data visualization in general. All right, so to think about making really good data visualizations, we have to sort of come to an agreement on how do we turn data into a visualization. Um, and, and some of you may have, may have been exposed to this um, or be aware of this, but there actually is uh, a system, um, we call it the grammar of graphics for taking data and turning it into a visual component. Um, and, and these are basically rules for how do we map our data um, to the page. Um, and, and, and it sort of follows this, uh, this nice little pyramid, um, you know, where we start with our data, our raw data. Um, we wanna think about our aesthetics, right? what from the data are we mapping to the page? You know, are we mapping, which variable are we mapping to the x-axis, to the y-axis, you know, things like that. And then what are those scales, right? We can't have uh, just any old scale um, for axes or for size or for shape. Right? We wanna specify what is the scale? How do, we, um, how do we distinguish between different values of our variables? What are our geometric objects? Um, are we using points? Are we using bars? Are we using lines? Are we using uh, color hue? Um, uh, what are we using to actually distinguish um, to, to put on the page? And then, you know, as we get into, as we get higher up on this pyramid, we get into um, more specialized situations. You know, do we need to uh, use summarized statistics? For our, for our plot, are we plotting the means? Are we plotting um, you know, error bars, things like that? Do we need to create subplots and facet things or do we need to you know, tweak our coordinate system? So 
So this is, um, you know, this is the grammar that we'll use. And this is the grammar that actually um, ggplot2 is actually built on, built using this, this grammar of graphics. So as, as just a really quick example, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, um, you know, this is, is a, a decent visualization, um, maybe a little too much going on, but I, I picked this one to kind of show you all the different aspects that go into making a visualization, right? So we've got this data set on cars and there, there looks like their fuel economy, their engine size, you know, their, their weight, things like that. And if we break this down, right, we can sort of pinpoint the different layers to this plot. We can see that our geometric object are these points, right? Our aesthetics, we actually have five of them, right? There's five variables, um, you know, being represented in this plot. So we've got X and Y axis position on those scales. Uh, we've got the shape, we've got the size, we've got the color of each of these points. All of these things are, are representing different parts of our data, right? So we can kind of look at this plot and work backwards and imagine what the raw data table might look like. Um, so, so yeah, this is, this is sort of what I mean by uh, the grammar of graphics, um, going from, you know, backwards from the plot to the data. Um, you know, we want to, we want to be able to identify those things. So that's sort of our foundation. Those, those are our, our building blocks of creating um, graphics, right? This grammar. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to create good visualizations, right? Um, that just means that we can go from data to, to plot, right? Um, we also want to think about, you know, some design principles and be a little bit more intentional with how we're creating what we're putting on our page. Um, and so using some of these design principles like elementary perceptual tasks and gestalt principles, um, they can really, really enhance the, the message that you're trying to convey. Um, now, these are not things that I, I don't bring up elementary perceptual tasks or gestalt principles in like an intro stats course, right? But I do think that it is important for students to, to think about intentionally designing what do they want to highlight in their, you know, in their plots? Uh, and, and this will help with, with that, thinking about these things. So, uh, you know, real quick, just when do we use these two, these two concepts? Um, el elementary perceptual tasks, you know, we typically use for making comparisons. We want to compare two different points, two different observations, two different groups. Um, you know, we kind of have the, the best way to make a comparison down to the worst or least effect, uh, effective way. So it's easiest for us as humans, for our brains, to make comparisons uh, of two points on, on the same scale, right? You know, which one's higher, which one's lower. Um, that's sort of the easiest for us to do. Um, it's not so bad, a little bit worse, but we can compare length pretty easily. Um, you know, we think about bar plots, um, which, which bar is taller, which one's shorter. It gets a little bit harder when we think of slopes or angles. That's why pie charts are, are maybe not as effective as bar charts. Um, and as we get down to, you know, color, um, comparing different hues uh, for different values, that can get kind of hard sometimes. So, so that's maybe not the most effective way of making a comparison between two points. Right. And, and then this, you know, affects our, our decision for how we want to, uh, what type of plot we want to create. Do I want to do a scatter plot or do I want to do a line plot, right? Um, and then uh, Gestalt principles, we, we typically want to think about using these for, for grouping, right? Um, looking for points or aspects of our visualization that have the same color, the same shape, right? We group them together you know, sort of automatically in our mind. Okay, we connect lines uh, for different groups to, to tell the story that, hey, these are all part of the same um, company or the same year. Um, and, and, you know, we don't necessarily use all of these um, all of the time. I would say that, you know, these five, uh, proximity, similarity, enclosure, symmetry, and connection, the ones that we, that we 
typically use most often. And of course, what I just did right now was I used the principle of enclosure, right? To highlight uh, a, a point, right? To group these five, uh, these five principles together. So it, it really is, it's, it's when, once you start thinking about these things, you start to see them, you know, sort of uh, everywhere uh, and they're, they're really useful. And I'll give you one example of, of this, um, uh, using these design principles for this uh, income across the years for STEM and non-STEM uh, areas based on different degrees and based on sex. So um, we're using you know, lots of different EPTs, position on a common scale for year and income, um, non-aligned scale for uh, non-STEM and STEM for sure. I threw in degree as well, even though they are sort of aligned, they're, they're separated. And then of course we have um, shape or pattern, you know, we've got our similarity for the different uh, sex. Uh, oh, that was our Gestalt principle. So similarity, enclosure are different facets and connecting these lines to see the trends here. So, and that makes a, you know, it makes a nice clear graph that tells a, tells a pretty compelling story, right? Okay, so that is, you know, a, a quick uh, 10 minute uh, data viz course um, for you, but uh, some things to think about as we, uh, as we start to create some visualizations um, and like I said, laying some foundation for how ggplot2 was, was sort of created. So, so let's actually get into the, to the bulk of this. Uh, of this webinar because there's a lot that I want to try to show you uh, that I can hopefully get through. And that is going to be how do we create visualizations using ggplot2. So ggplot2 is, uh, you know, I think by far the, the most used visualization package for R. Um, it follows the, the same sort of syntax um, uh, structure as the, the rest of the tidyverse packages. So when you're filtering or, or data wrangling um, in, using dplyr or any of the other tidyverse packages, it's going to have that same feel. It's, uh, it actually predates most of the tidyverse packages. So uh, some of the syntax is a little bit different that we'll, that we'll talk about. But essentially what it boils down to is, is it makes it you know, a lot easier to, um, to wrangle right in your, right in your um, ggplot to create lots of different iterations of plots um, to make small tweaks um, without changing the entire structure of the plot or without starting over. And it allows you to sort of be consistent from plot to plot. And that's really what coding you know, does rather than using a point and click um, system like Excel or um, you know, something like that. Um, you can do anything that you want with a plot in ggplot2. Um, that's an upside. The downside is that it, it you know, can become intimidating really quickly. Um, you can see these big chunks of, of code that you may not know what every piece is doing. And so what I wanna do is try to give you the tools, the understanding of the building blocks of you know, the main features of, of ggplot2 so you can understand those pieces and you can kind of break down those more complex, um, you know, complex pieces of code. And again, I think that this is a, another great reason for, for teaching uh, students how to use R for visualizations because it, it, it doesn't teach them to memorize how to you know, go to graph, then go to two sample, then go to you know, box plot. And they just memorize the order of how to do things. Um, but if they have to think about what line of code they're using or what, um, what type of variable they have, what aesthetic they're using, um, then, then they're thinking about the structure of the data and what that actually means. And, and I think that they're learning a lot more from that. So to kind of go back to that grammar of graphics, um, when we jump into ggplot2, we're gonna have some key vocabulary that you're gonna see repeated um, over and over again. Uh, and, and this is, like I said, based off of the, that grammar that we talked about. So 
we're, we're going to need data, right? Raw data to plot. We will need to identify the geometries that we want to use, the geometric obje objects, um, you know, the shapes or the, the way to represent the data. We're going to need to map our variables to the page using aesthetics. So what visual attribute does the uh, geometric object have? Define the scales for those aesthetics, for those variables. And then if we need to create subplots with facets um, or change our coordinate system um, or calculate some, you know, summary statistics that we are interested in seeing. So, like I said, these are all components of, of a basic ggplot. Um, we can understand how they relate to one another, um, but we don't need to memorize, right? That's uh, a, a one thing that I always, in an R um, webinar or workshop, I always want to emphasize is that if you're new at R, you don't need to memorize any of this. There's always example code out there. Um, you've got our code for this webinar for life now. You can keep it, you can copy and paste it and tweak it, um, but uh, none of us memorize every little aspect of, of you know, ggplots or, or anything else in R, right? We always look stuff up. R will still work if you don't memorize it. Um, so I, I do want to uh, also talk a little bit about preparing the data. We're not going to spend uh, too much time today thinking about uh, wrangling data um, or, or really too much time today talking about the, you know, the environment of R. Um, if you're still a little unsure about that, if you're, if you're just brand new at R, um, like Kate mentioned, we do have a previous webinar that you could watch um, to get you a little bit more familiarized with things. But I did want to point out that the data that you use with a ggplot in ggplot needs to be tidy. And what that means is it needs to be a data table where every row is a single observational unit, each column is a single variable, and every cell is a single value, right? And so we can't have like the last column be the sum of all the rows or, or the bottom row be uh, an average of the rest of the observations in the, uh, in the uh, you know, upper rows. Um, and so for example, you know, messy data, if we look at this, this example, we've got key and value, this, this, uh, these two columns. The key column is actually representing two different variables, right? It's representing a variable about the number of cases and the population uh, for a single country in a single year. So we would, we would really want to tidy this up so that we had just country, year, cases, population. This is our observational unit. Okay, so, so that's just what I, what I mean by when I say tidy data. All right, so let's switch over to R um, and work on some visualizations. Um, you know, like I, like I mentioned before, visualizations are like ogres and onions. Um, they have layers. And we'll see that as we start to build our plots. So you can, um, you can download this stat prep data viz webinar R code file. And whether you're using an R server or um, desktop R, um, you can upload it or open it. And you should be able to kind of pop into an environment that looks like this. So this should be the uh, document that I've posted in that R folder. I did change the name a little bit, but. And I'm gonna clean up my environment just a little bit. Um, we're not gonna really, pay attention to the environment. So I'm gonna minimize that window. I'm gonna clear my console to make it a little bit cleaner. I'm gonna give myself some more room for our plots. Um, all right. So let's start with just setting things up. Um, uh, don't forget that you do need to load your libraries that you're gonna be using. Um, to use some of these functions. So ggplot2 is an is a external package. It doesn't come in base R. Um, so we do need to load that library. 
Uh, and that library, you could just lo uh, load library ggplot2, um, but I, I like to just load the entire tidyverse because it gives me a lot of different uh, a lot of different packages that are really helpful. So tidyverse will include the ggplot2 package, and this gapminder library is going to be the is going to contain the data set that we use. So if you don't have either of these uh, either of these packages or libraries installed, then you can run this install packages uh, to install both tidyverse and gapminder. You just have to delete the, the pound sign and run that. Oops. I'll put that back. I don't need to reinstall it. Okay, and, and again, we cover a lot of this packages and libraries in our first webinar, but. So let's take a look at our data set, right? We're gonna load the Gapminder data and just view it real quick. So this is, it looks like 1,704 entries. So that's how many rows we have. Looks like we have six columns for country, continent, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. All right, so we've got a, a nice mix here, right? Numeric variables, um, uh, categorical variables. Uh, we, we, can, we can do a lot with this, with this data set. So let's, uh, let's start by, by building our, our canvas, right? If you don't like, like to think about uh, data viz as an onion, you can think about it like a paint, right? Um, there's layers of paint to, to kind of create our final product. Um, but before we do anything, we need a canvas. We need something to, to paint on. Uh, and, and that's where we kind of start big and then narrow down uh, in that, uh, that pyramid of our grammar of graphics. So if we start big, we start with the data set, right? We need to identify the data set that we want to use for our plot. So if you use just ggplot with our data set, Gapminder, you can actually get a plot. It's just blank, right? A blank screen, no axes, no labels, no nothing. But we have started our, our ggplot by identifying the data. Um, if I wanna start adding some axes and scales, then I need to identify my aesthetics, right? I need to map my variables to this blank screen, this blank page. So that's where the AES, and this is where we get aesthetics, um, comes in as an argument for our ggplot, where I define my x axis as GDP per capita, my y axis as life expectancy. You can see this will add our axes and it will automatically kind of define the scales as well, just based off the range from the data set. So my life expectancy, um, you know, it looks like it goes from 20 to 85 or so. And my GDP per capita goes from zero to, you know, over 100,000. Okay. And we can save this canvas, right? So right now I just kind of ran this line of code to show you the, uh, to show you the output in my plots window. But I can save the same line of code as just an object, I'll call it P, where I run P, nothing happens, but it actually got saved in R as this object P. So now anytime I ask for P, it will replot, it's kind of hard to tell, but it, it replot this, this blank canvas with my scales. Okay, so that's our blank canvas. Now we need to, add some of our layers, right? We need to add some geometric objects to this canvas, right? We need some bars or lines or, or points or something. Um, and this is where we've got lots of options within ggplot. Um, these are called our geons, right? And ggplot supports a ton of different geons, um, way more than what I've listed here, but, but these are some of the most commonly used ones. Right, geom point for different points like a scatter plot, geom line 
Geom bar, smooth is what we would use for regression lines. Um, violin, or you may, uh, if you're not familiar with a violin plot, you may be more familiar with a box plot. Um, geom count, geom density, again, more traditionally a histogram. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my preferences a, a, you know, a little bit later. So we need to add some geoms to our, to our canvas. Um, and the really nice thing about ggplot is that you can add things piece by piece. You can add these layers piece by piece. It doesn't, it doesn't all get contained in a single function in a single argument. I can start with P by canvas and I can just add a geom, add a layer with this plus. And if I do that, everything within P sort of higher up in the, in the chain gets inherited to anything below it. So the data, the aesthetics, the X and Y variables, everything that I defined in P will get inherited to my geom, right? So all I need to do is add a geom point to P and I get a scatter plot, right? I get the actual points for each of these countries and their GDP and their life expectancy across all the years, right? But I can start to define some different um, aspects within my geom. So if I don't want these points to be black, I want them to be a color, um, then I can add a color aesthetic. Uh, I, I can add a color to my uh, geom point as an argument to change these to steel blue. Now, notice that this color is not technically an aesthetic for ggplot because it's not linking, it's not being linked to a specific variable, right? We wanna think of aesthetics as uh, a characteristic of the data set. Steel blue is not a characteristic of the data set. It's just something that I wanted to, it's just a color that I wanted to make the points. So I don't put that color in an AES statement. However, if I do want to change the color of the points based on say what continent the country uh, belongs to, that would be an aesthetic, an attribute of the data set. So if I want my color to be conditional on an actual variable, that does need to be in an aesthetic. Okay, so I can add that aesthetic within my geom point to get different colors on the points for whatever continent they belong to. And I can kind of start to see maybe some patterns or see some trends by adding this third variable here. And we can keep adding layers, right? We can use more geoms. Um, we, can, we can add a line, right? So if I add geom line, it's going to connect the dots. It'll take a second. There's a lot of points, a lot of things to connect here. It's still thinking. There we go. And you can see that I connected the, the, the line for every single dot. But what's interesting about this is that the line is black and I've connected every single point um, regardless of what continent they were. So, you know, there's uh, points from Asia connected to points from Europe and, and that maybe doesn't make sense. Maybe that's not what I intended to do. Um, and that's because if you notice the color aesthetic that I set for the continent is not inherited to another geon. So this aesthetic is not what we call global, right? It's not, it wasn't defined in my original PGG plot. Only those aesthetics will get inherited further down the line. So geom line is just going to connect all the original points because it's not thinking about continent at all. If I, if I did wanna create, okay, a different line for each continent, um, different uh, color for each continent, um, then I would have to either put that, you know, color into the 
original ggplot. So here I've sort of re, rewritten that code. And there's a little bit of a line skip, but um, so I've got my data set, my aesthetics. Now I'm including color in the global aesthetics. Um, I'm going to do a little other, uh, a little bit more tweaking of things in my points. There's a lot of points, right? There's there's uh, 1,700 points, and those tend to overlap each other and kind of just make a big blob. Um, I want to change the transparency of those points, and I can do that with this alpha argument. Again, alpha is not uh, an aesthetic of the, the data set. It's just a, a tweak that I want to make um, to, to make the points a little bit more see-through. So give the give the points some transparency so I can see some overlapping. And I don't, maybe I don't want a connecting line. Maybe I don't want a geom line. I want a regression line for each of the groups, for each of the continents. So I'm gonna use geom smooth and I'm gonna give a different line type for each continent. So let's do this. We do get a little uh, message that uh, by default, GM Smooth is going to use a low S um, approach for fitting the line. We can we can change that if we want. But um, here, I see some I see some points that are uh, transparent. I see different lines with different line types. Some are dashed, some are solid. Um, different types of dashing and different colors. Right. So, so this is, I mean, this is not a great plot, but it illustrates some, some of these, uh, some of these ideas. You can always check the help documentation. Um, certain aesthetics will get inherited to certain geoms. Certain geoms have their own specific arguments. Um, you know, for example, geom point. If I look at that help documentation and I scroll down to the aesthetics, I can change, uh, I can change the alpha based off of, you know, a variable, numeric variable value, uh, but I can change color, group, shape, size, those kinds of things. Um, and then in geom smooth, I have some different options um, in my aesthetics, you know, like line type, or weight or Y min, Y max. So it's always a good idea if you're unsure about the, the syntax or what you can and can't use in a GM to just look at the help documentation um, to, to get a better sense of what's going on. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, we're gonna come back to this plot in a little bit, but I wanna give you some other examples because not everything is a scatter plot. Um, we do have other types of plots. For example, we have bar charts, um, which are really, you know, the bread and butter, I like to say, of data visualization. And I know students tend to not like them as much because I think they think that they're boring. Um, but really, there's, there's nothing wrong with a good bar chart. Um, they can be really informative and really useful. So I'm going to create a, just real quick, I'm going to create a subset of the data just so we don't have so many countries, so we don't have you know so many bars. But uh, I'm gonna create a, a subset called North America where we just have the US, Canada, and Mexico. And let's take a look at a simple bar plot of um, across the years, so a year on my x-axis, and the GDP per capita for each of these, uh, well, for, for the total of North America for each year. I haven't identified, I haven't used country yet. So this is the total North American GDP each year, um, you know, going back to 1954, I don't remember, to 2007, I think this data set covers. And um, one thing to point out is that what I've done in my GM bar is I've identified that the statistic is identity, meaning, if I look at my original data set, the GDP per capita is sort of gonna be the height of the bar, right? 
So what I'm saying is, um, you know, thinking about a bar plot in sense of a, a categorical variable, we would typically count and then the height of the bar would be the frequency. In this case, I want the height of the bar to be this actual value, the identity value of the cell. Um, and R will automatically sort of add up US, Canada, and Mexico for each of these years to get the height of the bar. So that's, that's what stat identity means. And that is something that we sort of run across uh, from time to time. Uh, if, I, if I want to give some more details, include some more variables here, if I want to include country and maybe color my bars based on country, um, I would use the fill aesthetic. Um, points and lines have color. Bars and area have fill. If you use color for a bar plot, it's just going to color the outside um, edges, the borders of the bar. But here I have filled the bar based off of the different country. We can see you know, the trends. Um, if you're not a fan of stacked, you can dodge your bars to get side by side. If you're not a fan of, of, of frequencies, um, you can get relative proportions by making the position fill. So these are you know, conditional um, bar plots for each year and we get the proportion of GDP per capita, um, of total GDP per capita for each of the countries. You can see, you know, oh, it looks like in the 80s, uh, Mexico was um, taking up a, a larger chunk of the GDP per capita and then um, kind of settled, settled back down to what it was in the 60s. So anyways, and, and this is, you know, way better than a pie chart. Um, based off of those EPT principles, right? It's easier for us, for our brains to compare um, lengths than it is to compare um, angles or area. But if you have to, you can create a bar, or, sorry, a, a pie chart by switching your coordinates from Cartesian, which would be the default to polar uh, by adding this polar, uh, chord polar option. This will give you a, a pie chart, the overall GDP per capita. Um, so like I said, bar charts are, are really important. Um, they come up a lot. Density plots and violin plots are also really important, really useful tools. Um, I prefer these over histograms and box plots. Histograms and box plots are sort of tools from an age where we were drawing things by hand um, or we didn't have a lot of computing power and we couldn't put a lot of detail. Um, but uh, I prefer, yeah, I prefer a nice density plot. So if I create a density plot as opposed to a histogram, I don't have to worry about things like bins or the, you know, the bin number changing the shape or the, the you know, uh, the look of the plot. This just gives me a nice smooth density curve. Uh, but you can easily change density to histogram and get a, get a histogram as well. Um, I can get different fills. I can break down my density plots based on my country by just adding more aesthetics. Um, I can take a look at the violin plot. Again, I prefer this to a box plot because it gives me a better sense of the shape um, of, of the data. And you can easily flip coordinate axes by using this chord flip. And you can also, like I said, if you really like box plots, you can add a box plot on top of your violin plot um, to get, kind of get the best of both worlds. Get that IQR, see where the median is, um, get any sense of outliers, that kind of stuff. So. Um, again, there's there's way more, uh, there's a lot more geoms um, than, than just this, um, but they all sort of work in these similar ways. Uh, so, so, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to kind of take these examples and, and run a little bit with, with some of the other geoms and, and try, try things out. But I do want to spend some more time, um, we'll see how much more time I, I have, but I want to talk a little bit more about 
you know, this idea of implementing some design to our, to our plots. So if I go back and I rerun this last scatter plot with the regression lines, this is a pretty, pretty bad plot. I mean, it's, it's, it's not terrible, but, it, but it's not great. I can't really tell what's going on here. Um, there's too much, there's too much color. There's, uh, I, I can't see where the lines actually are for like Oceana or um, the Americas. Um, there's just too much going on. So let me be a little bit more intentional and try to apply some of these Gestalt principles and uh, EPTs to make this better. Um, and the one thing that, that you know, is always a, a, a strong candidate for simplifying or pulling out your, your trends is enclosure, that, that Gestalt principle. It's one of the strongest principles if we can separate these by, by their groups, by their continent. Um, and we can do that with the facet, G, uh, not a GM, the, the facet function. So this will create subplots um, for each of our categorical groups for that variable. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Um, GDP on the X, life expectancy on the Y, using color for continent, using line type uh, as continent. But now I'm gonna use this facet wrap um, layer. And uh, it, it's a, another piece of syntax for ggplot is that when you're using a variable outside of an aesthetic, you need to have the tilde prefix. So it won't work without this little tilde in front of it. But if I do this, then I can see five different scatter plots, right? And it's a lot easier to tell what's going on for each of the continents to see what the trend is maybe. It's still not great. Um, now what I've introduced is a lot of redundancy. Um, I've got separate windows for each of the continents. I don't really need a color or a line type for you know, uh, all of these. So let me actually get rid of that, get rid of the, the color and the line type. And maybe I want a linear regression rather than this, this curved low S line. So I, I'm just gonna have my X and Y variables as my aesthetics. I do like having slightly transparent points. So I'll keep that. I'm going to change my method in my GM smooth to LM for linear model. And I'm gonna remove that, uh, that confidence interval band by using SE, SE equals false. Again, this is all stuff that you can kind of see in the help documentation, but here we go. This looks like uh, a little bit better uh, for me to kind of see what's going on with GDP per capita and life expectancy in the different, uh, in the different continents. I've saved this as, as P2, because I'm gonna use this as um, a sort of a starting point for the next, the next piece. Okay. So we're still, you know, this, this visually looks, looks better to me. Um, I can see some more of the trends. I can see some, some more of the slopes and, and things like that, uh, the differences across the different continents. Um, it's still not perfect. There's still a lot missing from this, um, a lot of smaller details. Um, I don't really like this, this x-axis scale, this GDP per capita. It, it looks like maybe it could be improved with a logarithmic transformation. Um, and so another nice piece about ggplot, right? We've talked about aesthetics, we've talked about geoms, talked about faceting. But um, we can also individually change the scales for an aesthetic by using um, a scale statement, essentially. So the scale statements to, to edit them, to customize them, typically go, um, you know, scale underscore whatever aesthetic you're trying to change, if it's color, if it's fill, if it's the X or Y axis. Um, and then how do you wanna change that? Um, how do you wanna make that change? So for example, if I add scale X uh, log 10, it's gonna automatically change this X axis scale, okay? 
So I am going to, um, I don't need to, I, I could run this x uh, scale x log 10 without this labels equals dollar, but I like this. It's in this scales package. Um, it will automatically put a nice little dollar sign in front of my x-axis to make it look even neater. So that spreads things out a little bit and that looks even better to me. So now we're looking at our, our uh, log scale here. I'm also missing titles, right? I don't have a, I don't have a main title. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't like my, my axes uh, titles, I, that could be better. Um, I don't have a data source, you know, it's you get in the habit of, of putting your data source maybe at the bottom corner. So the, uh, the labs function can take care of most of that. I can set my title, my subtitle, a caption, change my X and Y axes labels. Um, I also don't necessarily like this, this gray background kind of distracts a little bit uh, for me. So I can change the overall theme using the theme underscore, there's a, there's a lot of preset themes in ggplot. Um, BW is black and white. It's a very nice, basic, simple uh, theme. So let me show you what this looks like. So now I've got a title, life expectancy versus GDP per capita by continent from gapminder.org. Um, this is life expectancy at birth in years. GDP per capita in US dollars adjusted. I get a um, little bit sharper boxes for my, my facets. I don't have that gray background anymore. Yeah. This, looks, this looks a little bit cleaner for me. But you can definitely, you can, you know, start typing theme and you can see lots of different you know, classic, gray, minimal, um, lots of different sort of preset themes that you can try out to see what they to see what they do. But sometimes you you know you you need to tweak even further in, into something that is not part of a um, not part of a pre-made preset theme. Um, and that's where this sort of generic theme function comes in uh, and these element arguments. So and, and then this is where you know you get into the more advanced um, uh, fiddling with with ggplot, where I mean, I, we couldn't cover all of this in in a semester's worth of of webinars, or courses, or classes. Um, there's just countless combinations of different things that you can adjust. Uh, and yeah, if you work in ggplot long enough, you get really good at googling. Um, and the hardest thing is sort of knowing how do I read sort of somebody's answer to my question, right? How do I use the code that they provided? Um, and hopefully with, with this seminar, uh, with this webinar that you've, you've got a lot of the pieces to kind of put that together and to be able to piece through and, and figure out what's going on because um, geoms, facets, scales, labels, themes, that's going to get you a long way in uh, creating, creating really polished plots. So my, my sort of final plot here, um, the only thing that I'm going to do, not for any particular reason than to just show you, I'm going to get rid of the major and minor um, grid lines for the x axes. Not because I think it necessarily does anything, but just to show you. So this is sort of what my final plot looks like. Cleaned it up a little bit, and uh, I'm ready to. You know, maybe this is this is this is it. This is what I want. I'm ready to to use this plot in a paper or in, in class or wherever I might use it. And so that gets us to saving your plot, which um, I would avoid trying to. You know, like I know I have students who always zoom and then try to like right click and, and save or copy it. Um, or even if you're trying to export to an image, this is a little bit better than that. But it's not as good as actually saving your plot to your personal machine or to your directory. Um, 
So the advantage to saving your plot to your directory is that you have a lot more control over the size and the resolution of that plot. Okay, so first of all, um, I, you do need to know where your plot will, will get saved. Um, we're gonna use the GG save function. And to understand where it will get saved, you need to know your working directory. And you can always type in git wd to see your working directory. So I'm on my local machine. So it's just gonna be saved in my um, documents folder. I don't want that. I, I want it to get saved into this, um, into this R stat prep R workshops folder. So I'm gonna set my working directory to be just kind of uh, append this, right? So this is the current one. So after that, that's what this tilde means. It kind of means the current working directory and then put it in this R folder and then within the R folder, this stat prep R workshops folder. So that is now my new working directory. And when I save, I'm gonna save that as finalplot.png. It's gonna be the final plot, which I saved up here. A height of 10 or a width of 10, height of eight. These are inches. It's, it, I'm just kind of picking numbers, but DPI is really nice. The dots per inch will let you set the resolution. So when I run this, I can go into my file uh, and I can see there it is, final plot PNG and it showed up on my other screen. So there you go. Um, we're almost out of time, but I do want to I, I do want to uh, leave you with this, and then maybe we can see if there's there's uh, questions or give you some kind of final advice. Um, if you recognize this data, you know if you've used this data set before, uh, it is uh, sort of was made famous by uh, Hans Rosling, uh, who gave a really nice TED talk about 15 years ago. Um, using this data, and and he's a really great speaker, really energetic, and and uh, fun to watch. But um, uh, his final his final plots or his plots that he was sort of looking at in that talk was sort of this life expectancy and GDP per capita across the years. So our plot was kind of all the years clumped together. So what I've got here is just uh, a, a an extra plot that uh, you can take a look at. You can see if you can understand what's going on in each of these lines, what they're doing to create the, the Hans Rosling. Oops. That is a typo. I did a replace all earlier and that was apparently in there. But this is, uh, I will zoom for this one. This is across the years, 1952 to 2007, GDP per capita, life expectancy for the different continents, uh, different countries. Um, and then the continents are the different colors. So you can kind of see the progression of these across the years. And I would suggest going through this code uh, at your own time and just putting a, you know, putting a, a putting a hashtag, a, a pound sign in front of a, a line or two at a time, just to see what does that do to change the overall plot? Oh, if I get rid of the facet, then everything's all in one plot. And so you can kind of get a sense, uh, get a refresher of what each of these um, pieces does to, to change that plot. Um, all right, so, let me let me leave you. And we're just about out of time. Let me leave you with uh, a little bit more. Like I said, there's no way that I can cover everything there is uh, about ggplot in an hour. Um, feel free to to Google things. You know, looking at Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow are good starts. Um, you should hopefully have some more tools to read those answers, read those comments for for people um, uh, and their solutions to different questions. But also, you know, I, I hope I've maybe convinced you, given you some tools to, um, to teach data visualization in, in a uh, intentional way using some design. Um, you don't have to talk about EPTs or Gestalt principles, but um, you can definitely bring some 
some uh, design aspects into your classes. Uh, and then uh, again, we've got uh, I've got my links to resources in that R or in that Google folder that I shared with you. The uh, webinars that we've done in the past are on stat statprep.org. You can feel free to email uh, either Kate or I if you have questions. Hopefully, we've been able to uh, answer your questions in the question document if you've had any. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to look at those over the next day or so. And uh, we may not have time for questions, but thank you. If you have questions, we can stick around a little bit. Uh, Kate, do you have anything to, to add? I gotta unmute myself. I have nothing to ask to add. Um, thank you, Joe, so much for this. This has been very informative. Um, there has been actually no comment questions asked, so I didn't have to interrupt you to give you any questions, but please let us know if you have anything. Um, there will be other webinars that will be happening for Stat Prep. In, um, there'll be one in March and there might be one in April. And then we do have a workshop in May in uh, Southwestern, Florida Southwestern College in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, May 20th and 21st, and you can apply for that by going to the Step Prep website and going under workshops. Uh, so great, and thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for for attending. Um, the recording should be up uh, shortly, and you can rewatch and go at a slower pace if you need to. But um, let us know if you have any questions, and we'll see you at the next one. And and I'll agree with Joe. I like to just Google things a lot, and I like to <laughs> copy and paste. So you copy and paste this and then make the